because of the confusion that there is about the Holy Spirit, we started this series, Video Spirit, in order to address those things that most Christians have misconceptions, bad ideas, uh, dogmas, theological concepts that are incorrect. Because in the same way that we identify who God is as far as our Father, and how we treat him in regards to what we see a father as being, then likewise, if we have a misconception about God our Father, then the same thing will happen when we start to have a misconception about the Holy Spirit. We begin to get into weirdness or some strange kind of weird ideas that people like to add to their emotions instead of devotion towards God. So what they do is they create this kind of like ET force. You know, they want to create this new kind, of, new kind of idea that might incorporate some of the things that they have an issue with in Christianity. Sometimes people want to add people that seem to be good so that they can make a way of salvation that Jesus never said. And the reason why people do that is because we all have friends and relatives, we have neighbors, we have people that we know are good. As a matter of fact, we think of them as probably better than ourselves. We think that they live a good life. We think that they have good attitudes. We think that their actions are all good. And we look at them and we say, now there is a good person. Why shouldn't they go to heaven instead of me? And the point being is that it's not about being good, obviously, because Jesus said, no one is good except your Father which is in heaven. And likewise, he said, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So unless we can measure up to perfection, no matter how good we think someone is, good is not good enough, but perfect is. So we needed something else besides goodness to judge everyone by, including ourselves. Because it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves. So we're not saved because we're good. We're not saved because we're perfect. We're saved because of his mercy. So we have to learn how to be merciful. We have to learn how to be forgiving. We have to be learn how to be loving. And the only way we can do that is through His Spirit in us. Because without God's Spirit in us, we don't have the ability to love like He loves. We don't have the ability to be merciful like He is merciful. We can't turn the other cheek. We can't do the things that Jesus said unless His Spirit is within us. So, in order to understand this Spirit that God wants to put in us, this comforter that God wants to send to us, we have to study him and to understand who he is, what he is, and what he isn't, so that we don't come up with these weird ideas like God is a fire and he's going to burn you and you just want to be fully consumed, or God is some kind of dove, you know, that comes down, you know, and settles on you, you know, or that God is this kind of uh, force that's in the universe that all beings have their essence from it. No. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. God has a father aspect. He is separate in an entity uh, even of to himself as the Godhead we know being father, son, and spirit. He is an individual. We know that there is a son that God as when he appears in the physical form of a man will always appear as the son of God because that's what he did. He came in physical form, revealing himself as the Son of God. Anytime that we want to see God in physical form, we look at Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And when we want to see God in the Spirit, then we look at the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is a person. There are those that want to make the seven spirits before the throne of God, the seven spirits before the throne of God, something other than what they are. The reality is, is that God has not given us the full picture of everything that he is because we can't understand completely the Godhead. But it says that he has revealed it even in nature to us. He has shown us that there is a Father, there is a Son, and there is a Spirit. He said that in all of creation that is revealed. So what we do is we study the Holy Spirit in order to have a better understanding and comprehension. That all these images that you've seen of a dove or a fire or all these things will come up and we'll begin to discuss them and explain them. How people have gotten carried away because of the things that they emotionally feel. And sometimes emotions have a way of creating in us exaggeration. 
So what we've done is we've decided to take for our text Chuck Smith's book on living waters, the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because there's never been, in my personal opinion, in 35 years of being a born-again Christian, anything that was just quite the same as what Chuck taught in the Holy Spirit series on Charisma versus Charismania and all those things where people got so carried away that he finally did a series on it teaching how simple, really, God is in what he's revealed to us and that we don't need to add to it in Pentecostalism and we don't need to detract from it in traditionalism, but we can accept it for who he is as he's revealed himself to us. Because God said he would send us a comfort. He would send us the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said that we needed to receive power on high, but not that the Holy Spirit is a power. He has ability to give, to help us, to enable us, to show us, to reveal to us things, to give us certain capabilities that we don't have of ourselves, but that we have through him. He was meant to be, and always has been, to reveal Jesus to us. Because without the Spirit of God, we could not know Jesus. Without the Spirit of God, the Bible makes no sense. So that Spirit of God needs to come in us, to live with us, to change us, to recreate us, to make us into the image of the incorruptible Son of God. And that way he does that is by inhabiting us, by almost like you would say, spiritually possessed. Well, yeah, because you're dispossessing yourself in order to possess it himself. Jesus made it very clear and very blunt. There is no doubt about what he said. He would come in to you and live within you. It would be God living inside you. And anyone that's born again of the Spirit, they've been born of the flesh, which is obvious, as you can see, and I can see you, and you can see me. We are born of the flesh. But Jesus said something beyond that, that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You must be spiritually born. So there is something more that happens to us as we become born again. And that's what the Spirit of God does. And that's why we're studying this. And we want to keep in mind that as we grow in the knowledge of who God is, we will be changed in the way that we treat others because God's Spirit is peaceful. It's loving. It's joyful. He is merciful. He is kind. He is gentle. He is full of grace and mercy. He is loving kindness personified. He is what we want to be. And so as you study and listen and watch and read and follow along, if you want to get the book, It's Living Waters by Chuck Smith, you can apply for yourselves those things which God will teach you. Because it's not me sitting here and reading to you and telling you what is true or what isn't true. It's the Spirit of God who causes you to hear what it is He wants you to hear. I don't know what you'll hear. I don't know how you'll apply it to your life. I don't know what it is that you'll get out of the message. But I do know that God himself will reveal himself to you as you choose to follow him. So going along, we're in Who is the Holy Spirit? In Personality Plus. And this is Changes in the Wind. But by the 14th chapter of John, the winds of change have begun to blow. Jesus is making it plain that he is about to go to the cross to be crucified. Although his disciples don't understand everything, he says, Nevertheless, they are deeply disturbed by his words. They don't want him to go away, and their hearts quickly fill with fear and turmoil. The very fact that Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled, indicates that his men were troubled, and they were afraid. What will we do without Jesus, they wondered. So Jesus answers their unspoken question. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. John 14, 16 and 17. This is a pivotal point in the Gospel of John. Jesus is saying to his friends, it's true. Yes, I am going away. And that where I am going, you cannot come right now. But don't be worried. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And in time, I will come again and receive you unto myself. But in the meantime, I will not leave you comfortless. 
I will not leave you without any help. I will ask the Father to give you another to come alongside you, to help you. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you comfortless. The Greek word translated comfortless in John 14:18 is orphanous, or literally, I won't leave you as orphans. I will not leave you as orphans, Jesus promised his friends, and to keep that promise, the Master said he would pray to the Father and ask him to give the disciples another comforter. In Greek, the word translated comforter is parakletos. Para, or para, is the Greek preposition for with or alongside of, while kletos, kletos, is the word for called. So Jesus is telling his friends that he will ask the Father to send another helper who will come alongside of them to help them. And the help they would receive would be the helper himself. Without that help, without being helped, you can't witness Jesus. Without help, without that helper, you can't be a Christian. Jesus was very clear that to be born again, they had to have that spirit. And he says to his friends, you have the spirit and he will come to you because he will be with you. And the way that we know that we have that spirit of God is by becoming born again. We must first be born again in order to receive the spirit of God. So Jesus brought them to a place where they did acknowledge that they were following Jesus and they laid down their lives for him and they took up their cross and followed him, so to speak, and they were willing to follow him even unto death. But they were not willing to really find out how much they would need more than what they were able to do until they went through the trials that were to come upon them. Once they did, they fell away. They completely turned their back on God. At different times after Jesus was crucified, they had literally chosen not to believe in what Jesus said. Now when the Holy Spirit came upon them, suddenly they were filled with this ability to know and understand and comprehend what it was that Jesus had said because Jesus promised the Helper, even the Spirit of Truth, would come upon them and they would know the truth. That is the same that is true today. Without there being the Holy Spirit in some way coming upon a person, either influencing them on the outside or talking to them on the inside, they will not understand what Jesus is saying. They cannot comprehend what the Bible teaches. They will not accept being born again unless God, by His Spirit, draws them. That's why we're told it's the love of God, or put it into a parenthetical, when you say the love of God, it's the agape of God that draws them into repentance. God loving a person pulls them to himself. He reaches out with his arms and envelops them by his spirit. It is God so loving the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. They will not perish if they choose to accept that gift that God is giving of grace to them through that work that Jesus has already done and then allowing his spirit to come in them. Because First John tells us that he who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. The way we have that is by the Spirit in us. So when the Spirit of God comes alongside us and helps us, he makes it able to understand even the very words I just said. He makes us able to read the Bible and look at it and say, Wow, today this part stood out at me. That's God speaking to me. And to know that by faith it's true. God speaking to you. Without that, you cannot know God. Without the Holy Spirit, the person with you, abiding with you, teaching you, leading you, and guiding you, none of this religious jargon makes any sense at all, and you're simply following a, following a dead religion and not the Spirit. When Jesus said, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, he was talking about in the Spirit of God, because those people would see God and know God. Other than that, people worship sometimes what we call an impotent God, a God of their own making, a false 
deity because they're worshiping an idol as opposed to the actual living God because their God is dead and they don't have the actions or the attitudes or the changes that the Spirit of God, we're told, would do in the life of a believer. As we begin to go through this, you'll see that knowing the Spirit isn't just about knowing about Him, but it's His work in us to reveal Jesus living inside us, not only to ourselves, but to the angels in heaven, to the people around you, to the very nature of all of the universe itself, to Satan himself, and as a testimony to what God has done in saying, God with us and God in us. That is the work of the Spirit of God as he works through us and in us to cause us to become children of God. Father, I thank you that your Spirit is always with us, that you have promised to send him to us, that you would cause him to live with us, and that you would cause him to be in us. Lord, I pray for those that don't know you, that maybe possibly haven't been born again, that they would come to the realization of your Spirit, that he would open their eyes and cause their ears to hear things they never imagined they would ever hear or understand, that suddenly now they know there's something missing. There is a gap between them and God. There is a difference between this religion of Christianity and this relationship with God himself. Father, I pray that you would send Jesus and the Holy Spirit to minister to those that don't know you. Because Jesus as our high priest can touch that life that doesn't seem to understand that he came in the flesh and that he does know what it's like to have doubts, to have fears, to have anxieties and worries but that he promised he would come into and be with and sup with those that would call upon him. So I pray, Lord, you would help those that don't know you to call upon you now, in Jesus' name. But also, God, I pray that not just those that don't know you, but those that do, that the Spirit of God would be working to mellow them out, but to bring them into the fullness of the realization of Jesus in their life, that they would hear you, that they would know you, that they would love you, God, for who you are. For Father, if it's not but that the Spirit of God revealed Jesus to them, and that Jesus said that you desire to know us, how would we know you, Father, except that it be from the Spirit and the Son revealing you to us? So God, I thank you that you are teaching us by your Spirit, that you are leading us by your love, that you are forgiving us by your grace, and that, God, you are having mercy upon us. In Jesus' name.